here and running. How about that? Okay. We've been talking all through the Lent about what it means to be born to thrive, and what we've, we've said really to be born to thrive is more, maybe more accurately described, you are reborn to live in Christ abundantly. And over the last few weeks, we talked about, number one, that all of this begins with repentance, that is with confessing our sins to God and receiving the forgiveness that is freely ours in Jesus Christ. Number two, we talked about trusting in God and not in things. We talked about being bold in prayer and being prepared to be helpful to our neighbors. And in a sense, tonight we're going we're gonna to bring all of this together as we reflect on mammon and God. And if you don't know what mammon is, you'll find out shortly. We're going to look at Jesus' parable uh, of the unjust manager and related teaching right afterwards. And we'll learn again, be reminded, that Christ is merciful. God is merciful. And he calls his people, that's us, to, to trust with our whole lives, to rely totally and absolutely in everything on that mercy. So then, we should have done this earlier, but uh, what is a parable? Now, there's an image of Jesus teaching his disciples. What is a parable? A parable is a story, at least uh, Jesus' parables, are stories that, that, te- that have a spiritual purpose, make a spiritual lesson. And these stories typically involve everyday life and objects and the events and locales even of life at the time of Jesus. Well, it leads then to the qu- second question perhaps is why did Jesus tell parables. Now, the common answer to that question, and I I hear this all the time, why did Jesus tell parables? Well, Jesus told parables and used all these every day because he wanted to make it easier for people to understand. Here's the thing. That's actually not biblically accurate. According to Jesus, anyway, he often told parables to test people, to see if they really trusted God and his word or wanted to. Now, I don't have the whole quotation for you in your sermon notes here, but let's look at Matthew 13. The disciples came and asked him, why do you speak to them, the people, in parables? And Jesus answered them, to you, the disciples, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Indeed, verse 14 In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. And then Jesus says to the disciples in verse 16, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Calls to mind a number of passages, one of which is from Romans 10. Verse 17, faith, the faith that allows us to see it, faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. That, and as St. Paul teaches in Ephesians, that faith itself is a gift because we are dead in our trespasses and sins by nature. But God has given us the gift of faith, the gift of grace, salvation, the life that we have. This is itself is a gift, the ability to hear and see. You, as we'll talk about, may be counted among those now, like Jesus said, who have been given ears to hear and eyes to see. These parables, again, are a test to see whether we will embrace the grace of God and live it out, or whether we will reject God and live selfishly and ignorantly. Let me repeat that. The parables are a test to see whether we will embrace this grace of God in faith and live it out, or will we reject God and live selfishly and ignorantly. 
Which brings us then to the parable of the unjust manager. Now, I, I have been using a whole host of slides and images in my Lenten series, but Pastor Charnel is not going to use them next week, and so I thought I would go from taking many to go to a few, all right? And that's perfectly okay. Um, in fact, it has its distinct advantages. Let's look at this parable. All the verses are printed for you there in your sermon notes. So Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. So in the larger context, which you have pictured here as a, a large uh, landowning, you know, not a large man, but it could have been a large man, a, a rich landowner, lots of land and property and people who various owed him debt. And he, he had a, a manager, a steward, who was responsible for collecting all of the rents and other things. So he finds out, this rich man does, that his, his manager is a scoundrel. He's a cheat. And so he, he brings him to account. And he calls him, this is verse 2, and he says, what is this that I hear about you? In the Greek, it's continuous. What is this that I'm hearing all the time about you? Turn in the account of your management. That is, turn in the books. Because you, know, you can no longer be manager. In other words, you're fired. Okay? All this stuff has come in, turn in the books, you're fired. Now, what happens next in the parable is interesting. Nobody else in the community, so imagine village life, right? Nobody else in the community, all these people who this man is, this rich landowner is, is generous and a pillar of the community and a, a great philanthropist and everybody, nobody knows yet that the steward has been canned. And so the manager walks away and he thinks to himself, this is verse 3 and 4, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm removed from the management and people will receive me into their houses, right? What this guy is going to do is he is going to stake his entire life, he's going to stake everything on the fact that the rich man is gracious and merciful. Listen to what happens. So, summoning then the master's debtors one by one. Again, nobody in the community yet knows that he's been fired. So he begins to summon all the debtors in, one by one. He says to the first, how much do you owe my master? He says, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, quickly write it down, write 50, cuts it in half, right? Then he says to another, how much do you owe? A hundred measures of wheat, he said. And he says, take your bill and write 80. So by context here, he does this with all these sorts of people, right? All this is truncated in the parable, but you, you get it in the context. The next verse tells us what happens. The master then commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. The rich man finds out that all these deals had been cut. And so he immediately has to make a decision. And all these deals were cut while everybody knew or every, you know, nobody knew that the manager had been fired. He either has to go back to each member of his village, or all these people, and say, well, I just canned him, you know, and they, they had no doubt after all these debts had been reduced, they'd been whooping it up and talking about how great and wonderful and generous this man. So he has to decide whether he's going to say, oops, sorry, now you owe it, or whether he's going to absorb the loss and prove to everyone again how gracious and generous he is. And that, in fact, is what, in the parable, this dishonest steward banked his whole life on. And so the manager, call, the rich man calls him in and commends him for his shrewdness. In other words, you are a clever little scoundrel. <laughs> but he doesn't boot him out. Right? Then Jesus says, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. What's the, what's the point of this parable? 
Now, and again, this is difficult. This is not like, this, right? This is not easy. <laughs> contrary to, you know, Jesus tell, the contrary to what we started off with. So Jesus tells parables to make sure everybody would easily understand. This is, this is not easily grasped. He's teaching, Jesus is teaching, if, if this scoundrel, if this thief knows enough to rely on the grace, the gracefulness of this earthly landowner, how much more basically should the people of God rely utterly and totally, stake their whole lives on the grace of God who is truly good? Again, Christ is merciful. And he calls us, his, his people, to trust, to trust our whole lives to that mercy. Now, that parable itself is a little challenging. <laughs> now it gets even more fun. Next slide here. Then Jesus says, I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. Greek word, mammon, earthly resources. Make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so when, that when it fails, that they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. And the point here is actually fairly simple. Jesus teaches this throughout the scriptures. Our earthly resources, what we have, is a gift. They are the opportunity to earn a living. What we have is a gift. And as recipients of this grace, God intends for us to use these earthly resources to help others. You know, you, it's unrighteous. It can't be taken into heaven. This unrighteous wealth or unrighteous, you know, you can't, right? We say this at funerals. You can't take it with you. But that doesn't mean that it is, shall we say, utterly worthless, as we'll hear in just about in a minute. God intends for us to use the resources that we're given to help others. Now, the next verse is verses 10 through 12 in chapter 16. Jesus then says, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Do you want to thrive? Don't waste what God has given to you. God is generous. So therefore, be generous. Jesus is saying here, and not just here, that there is a direct relationship between the management, the stewardship of our earthly treasures. There's a direct relationship between the management of these earthly treasures and his dispensation of greater spiritual gifts here and elsewhere. There is a, there's a direct relationship between our management of these earthly resources and his dispensation of the greater spiritual treasures. And here then is the kicker, the final verse, verse 13. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, literally God and mammon unrighteous wealth. You cannot serve. <clears throat> you cannot worship both. At the end of the day, what Jesus is saying is this is a first commandment issue. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. And in Luther's magisterial explanation of this, we should fear love and trust in God above all things. 
At the end of the day, right, this is what it comes down to. This is a first commandment issue. You shall have no other gods that we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Well, friends, to repeat Jesus' words to the disciples in Matthew 13, to you, to us, has been given the secrets of the kingdom. You are baptized into Christ, recipients of the Holy Spirit, washed by his forgiveness, claimed by God, his children. To us, have been given the secrets to the kingdom. And I want to offer a, a summary here. These parables are a test to see whether we will embrace the grace of God and live it out or reject God and live selfishly and ignorantly. That's what they are. In these parables, Jesus is testing us to see whether we will embrace the grace of God, to trust him fully, to live it out, or reject him and live selfishly and ignorantly. Or, as our central thought here, Christ, right? Christ is merciful. His people, that's his call to us, his people trust. We stake our whole lives, our very beings, the lives of our, we stake everything. Regardless of the circumstances, we stake everything on the mercy of God. Let's pray. In fact, that is in your sermon notes, I think. Would you mind? Why don't we pray that together, if you would? Should be. Is it all there in your sermon notes? Should not Let's pray that together. Lord, all that we have is a gift from you. Above all, we thank you for your forgiveness in Christ. Help us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Help us also to be faithful with our earthly resources, that we may use them not for ourselves alone, but in service to others. You are merciful, Lord. Help us to rely totally on that mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.